Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 23. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual of forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant of the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks so much, guys. Good morning, everyone. How are we all? Good to see you. My name is Andy. If I haven't met you before, it is my privilege to serve as the senior pastor here at Warmbra Community Church. I just want to, before we start, just echo some of what Danny said. Add my welcome to his. If you're new or if you're visiting or thinking about making Warmbra Community Church your home, special welcome to you. I really want to push you towards the welcome desk after the service uh, and look at signing up to one of our life groups and getting involved here and becoming part of the family. If you have got youth or kids in your life, it is a special time to join our church family because uh, this week um, our kids club and youth group resume uh, this Friday. I know the parents will be relieved about that and uh, the kids will be happy about that. Um, Our youth group this year, this term, are embarking on a seven-week journey looking at the the person, the message, and the mission of Jesus. They're going to be opening up Mark's Gospel. They're all getting a copy of Mark's Gospel. I'm really diving deep into the person, uh, the message, and the mission of Jesus, going through something called Soul, which is the youth version of Christianity Explored. So it's going to be great for to invite friends along to who are looking into Christian things. And it's all can, also going to be good for those kids from church homes so they can go deeper into the gospel and the person of Jesus. I also wanted to share some sad news at this point uh, before the preach. Just that we, um, to say that at the end of last term, our youth pastor, Christine Stout, made the decision to resign from her role as youth minister. Uh, We haven't announced that from the front, mainly because it's been the holidays, but wanted just to say, in case you haven't heard, uh, we are sad about that, and we are grateful for Christine's ministry. She's just done an incredible work in the youth space. The youth group has, has grown, and so we're sad that she's stepping down, but pleased that she's staying remaining along with her family as part of the church family here and part of the community. Um, we celebrated Christine. We, gave, we loved on her. We gave her gifts. We prayed for her, taught the kids uh, what it means to do a gospel farewell in the Christian life just at, at the end of term. But I wanted to let you know just so that if you have been impacted by her ministry, you can reach out to her and say thank you and show your gratitude 
and also to ask you to join us in praying for the next youth pastor who will take on that ministry and grow and forward that ministry here at Warmbridge. It's just a, a wonderful place of God's presence and God's favor and God's grace that we are seeing in our youth ministry. So do please be praying for that as we seek to reach the next, generos- the next generation of Rockingham, next generation of youth with the gospel of Jesus. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that next week we are starting a five-week sermon series called More Than a Sunday. Uh, we're looking at, and we're going to be looking at what it means for um, Jesus to impact the whole of our lives, not just a Sunday. And I know we know that, but we're going to be exploring that over five weeks, and hopefully that'll be really helpful and really practical and really give value to uh, the, the lives in which we live and give validation to things that perhaps the church has not given validation to uh, in the years gone by. So hopefully you'll come along to that, and uh, hopefully, God willing, we will all benefit from that. Let's pray, and then let's stu- get stuck into this final installment of Ephesians. Father, we do praise you for your goodness and your grace to us and amongst us. We praise you just for the wonder of being partners in your work, in your world, that you have a plan to unite all things under Christ uh, for the praise of your glory. And I praise you that we get to be part of that, to invest in that, to serve in that, and to see that happen here in Rockingham. And we pray today that you would further your plan, that you would speak into our lives and you would change us from the inside out to make us a little bit more like Jesus for your glory and our good we pray. Amen. Well this morning I also want to announce a brand new three week course. Uh, You're welcome to come to it. It is called Ruining Your Faith and Church or RYFC as we like to call it. You could call it a crash course. It is a three week course Uh, Week one, we'll be looking and focusing on ruining relationships. There'll be a a session on the art of passive aggression. There'll be a breakout on adultery. And there will be a study on a new trend, which uh, is known as ghosting. On week two, uh, we're going to be looking at wrecking your church. Topics will include uh, an overview of Sunday alternatives to meeting with God's people, uh, how to invest your financial giving elsewhere other than the church, and there will be a practical hands-on session on how best to complain about the pastor's choice of shirt. (laughs) Week three, (laughs) great shirt, thank you, pay you later. Uh, th- week three, uh, which is the pinnacle. It's the pinnacle. We, uh, it is on ditching your faith. Now, we reckon weeks one and two will have got you to that point uh, pretty much, but we're still going to cover the topics of the benefits of not reading your Bible or praying and the art of blending in. Anyone up for that? Good, good, good. Now, start with that silliness. So that we can see just at what's at stake in this final installment of our Ephesians passage. Because Ephesians 6 is in our Bibles to stop us from ruining our faith and wrecking our church. It is a passage that tells us that the devil is on the loose, attacking Christians, targeting churches, with the goal of making us give up on Jesus and wrecking his church. See, when it comes to thinking about the devil and Satan, either we can treat Satan like he doesn't exist. You know, we don't see him and therefore he doesn't exist. And if he did, he would look a bit like this. You know, the the comedy little goat man with the little beard and the spiky horns. Totally laughable and not a threat. Alternatively, some of us can see Satan and spiritual attack anywhere. And we can be like one of those paranoid uh, war vets 
walking around looking for demons under every rock and seeing spiritual attack in everything. Now, we need to take Satan seriously. But as we open chapter 6 of Ephesians and land the plane, as it were, we'll see that we do not need to fear. We do not need to fear, but we do need to take Satan and his attack seriously because there is a a real vicious spiritual war on. Now, we can't see that war, but we feel it close. There are no bomb threats in this war, war, but there is a very real threat to your and my relationship with Jesus. And in this war, the, the battle scars are wrecked lives. They are broken marriages. They are split churches and Christians giving up on living for Jesus. The author and the pastor A.W. Tozer says, often we think the world not as a battleground, but as a playground. We're not here to fight. We are here to follow. Incredible, isn't it? Very insightful, very true. But perhaps you're here this morning and you're feeling the battle scars. You're feeling bruised. You're feeling exhausted. And you might be here and you're ready to give up on Jesus. Let me say it's wonderful that you're here. It's wonderful that you dragged yourself here this morning because Ephesians 6 is in our Bibles. It's a gift to you and me this morning so that we would take that feeling seriously so that we would not give up on Jesus, so that we would stand firm in the battle as we take Satan and his war seriously. I reckon verse 10 is the thrust of this passage. If you've got a Bible, feel free to follow along in your Bible or your app or it'll come up on the screens. Verse 10, thrust of the passage. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. This is the final thing in Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And that sentiment's all the way through uh, the passage. Verse 11, take your stand. Verse 13, stand your ground. Verse 14, stand firm. Three things for us this morning then for this battle with Satan. First, The enemy is dirty. The enemy is dirty. Verse 11. uh, We see his tactics. Uh, Paul writes, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now Paul, when he's talking about the devil, he doesn't mean the ha 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 devil, the little man in the little red leotard and the little tail and the little plastic pitchfork. When Paul says devil, he is talking about a crafty, invisible, scheming con artist. A very real enemy who is trying to scam you out of your trust in Jesus. I don't know whether you've noticed at the minute there seems to be a lot of scams around. People phone you up and claim that they are from some organization or some company. I was called up by the Australian tax office telling me that I hadn't paid my tax and there was a warrant out for my arrest and I better look over my shoulder. The scam, I didn't fall for it. Uh, there are scams out there and they're getting crafty and craftier. I've heard of one person who got phoned up by Microsoft and was convinced, uh, got convinced to g- into giving them all their login details for their computer and they had their their bank account drained. I read of a scam recently, and I think we've had this at home, where you get an email from a parcel company telling you that you've got an amazing parcel, and if you just pay the, the, the shortfall and the delivery fee, then they'll drop it round to you. Anyone get that one? Well, the devil, the, those schemes have nothing on the devil's schemes. He is even craftier than the email scammers. He hasn't got a patch on the Australian tax office schemes. Last week we heard that um, Christians, or the last few weeks, we've heard that Christians, uh, Christian relationships display the gospel of Jesus. 
that the way that we do church relationships, marriage relationships, family, working relationships, all of them display our relationship with Jesus and further God's plan. So when we think about the devil's tactics, it makes sense, doesn't it, that Satan would target those relationships. And he's not going to do that in an obvious way. We hear that he is a schemer. He's a schemer. He is a crafty con artist. So he's not going to target those relationships in an obvious way. He won't stand outside church with a big placard like the, uh, the um, politicians offering us a church split. He is not going to call you up with uh, a, an overseas accent claiming to be from the Australian tax office offering you an extramarital affair. He is crafty and he is invisible. To quote Kaiser Soze in that amazing film, The Usual Suspects, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And so he'll try and scam us out of our relationship with Jesus by stealth. He'll seek to destroy our church not by having the government ban us or destroying the building, but making us so lukewarm in our love for Jesus and his mission that we just become spiritually impotent and don't care and don't grow. And it'll just happen over time. And he'll try and destroy marriages, uh, not by some obvious means, but by causing the gradual neglect in the relationship over time. And then in introducing exactly the right person at the right moment to exactly the right spouse that will cause them to leave that marriage. He'll destroy families, he'll destroy friendships, he'll destroy our communities and our missional zeal, and we won't even know that he's doing it. Such is his self, stealth. Paul writes, verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Uh, the word struggle there literally uh, translated means wrestle. And that's really helpful. Because this battle is dirty. It is gritty. It is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, if you've been a Christian any length of time, I know there's people here who aren't Christian, but... I'll ask a Christian and they will tell you they they will tell you that they don't need the Bible to tell them that that the Christian life feels like a wrestling match sometimes. But we do need the Bible to tell us who against that who that wrestling match is against. You read there the, the rulers, authorities, the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If you're in Christ, you are engaged in one massive spiritual battle against a massive spiritual fighting force led by Satan. And he targets the Christian not because he cares about you, not because he cares about Andy or cares about Maurice or he cares about Johnny. He targets the Christian because he seeks to dishonor Jesus. See, all the way through Ephesians, we've heard that our blessing, our life, our community, our church is in Christ. In Christ we have every spiritual blessing. In Christ we've been raised from death to life. In Christ we are God's church. And so Satan targets the Christian not because he cares about the individual, but because he seeks to dishonor the Christian by dishonoring, he seeks to dishonor Jesus and his church. Now, you don't need to start 
freaking out uh, about spiritual attacks. You know, I'm under spiritual attack. Satan's got me on the ropes. We don't need to start kind of panicking. Don't need to start calling the Ghostbusters or Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But we do need to take Satan seriously and know what's going on behind the scenes. That's why I think he's put it in here, to take us backstage and see the the cosmic spiritual battle that is happening when life is hard. To know what is happening when you become lukewarm to Jesus. Uh, To know what is happening when you feel like you come to church and no one cares about what you are going through. To know what is happening when marriage is hard. To know what is happening when you feel like writing that email and really blasting someone out because they've done something that you didn't like. There is a spiritual battle waging. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Satan and his minions are targeting the Christians because he seeks to dishonor Christ. And they're dirty fighters. Dirty fighters, scheming fighters. Paul says if you're in Christ... The devil will fight you for the rest of your life. And so we need to stand firm. And if we're going to stand firm, then we need to defend ourselves. And that's the next thing for us this morning, that defense is essential. Defense is essential. Verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. See the repetition of, of stand. Uh, the image in these verses is of the Christian clothed head to toe in the armor of God, wearing the full, complete armor. Not a bit, not just two out of five, every single bit. And you'll know that the image is taken from the image of the Roman soldier tooled up for battle. It's one of the most ferocious images in the ancient world. And Paul isn't just telling us about Roman armor. He's telling us about God's armor and charging us to put it on. Put it on because it has been used before with vicious effect in the Old Testament. See, this armor is not didn't just appear in Ephesians 6. This is second-hand armor. It's been gathered up and collected right from the Old Testament, right throughout the Old Testament and the Old Testament story. So the belt of truth, that is worn by God's warrior king in Isaiah 11. The breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, they are worn by God in judgment in Isaiah 59. The feet fitted with readiness is taken from Isaiah 52 and it's the image of of the people who proclaim God's victory. The shield of faith that belonged to Abraham is the pin-up boy of faith in Genesis. The sword of the Spirit is God's sword given to God's messenger Isaiah to proclaim God's rescue and God's judgment. So you can track the Bible story. You can see that this armor has been invented and collected and gathered up so that we, the New Testament church, we, the the people of God, would put it on. Would put it on. This is not second hand. It is second hand armor, but it is not a dodgy op shop purchase. It is tried and it is tested by God himself and given to us who are in Jesus. Because this is Jesus' armor. See, that is gospel armor. It's gospel armor so that when Satan hits us with lie after lie, we would preach the gospel to ourselves and preach Jesus to ourselves. So when Satan tells you, ah, oh, God stopped working in Warmbr, it's just a, just a toddler jam and a social club, The belt of truth says that God is not done with Rockingham yet. The belt of truth says that the 
the, the, the church, Warmbra Community Church, is the trophy cabinet of Jesus, and Jesus is adding to it all the time. We had a, a wonderful baptism at the 9 a.m. this morning. Jesus is at work reaching the next generation with the gospel. Jesus is at work raising the next generation of Christian leaders through and in this place for our world. When the devil digs his finger into your chest and says, you're not good enough to be a Christian. The breastplate of righteousness protects you. It says, God has made you good enough in Jesus. It doesn't matter about you. God has made you good enough to be a Christian in Jesus. And when you slip up with that sin again and again, and the devil whispers in your ear and says, God is never going to forgive you for that one. You've done that one too many times. The helmet of salvation protects our thinking so that we know that Jesus has paid it all. So that we know that we are saved and that we cannot out the grace of God. That's what wearing the armor looks like. It's a a picture of being head to toe in gospel armor. The armor of God, the truth of the gospel that overlays the gospel onto our broken reality as we do life in our broken world and says Jesus has won. Jesus has conquered. Now this gospel armor is not to be used in solo combat. It wasn't designed that way. Roman armor was not designed just to use in solo combat. The armor that Paul is bringing to light here is designed to be used as an army, as a team. It's to be used as a church. So every time uh, we hear the word you in this letter, we need to hear the Australian use. Use, 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 put on the armor of God. To put on this armor as a church. See, the shield was a, it was a massive thing. It covered you from head to toe. But it was designed to be used with other shields. So soldiers kind of got together, they clinked the shields into place, and they would, uh, they would form themselves into like this mini tank and go into battle together as this little unit or this little tank, which is pretty useful when you've got darts or arrows coming out of the air trying to kill you. It creates this impenetra impenetrable fortress. I think they were doused in water as well to dis extinguish uh, the arrows. The charge here is that we would take up our shields together, that we would take up our shields with each other, for each other, trusting the promises of Jesus together. Same goes for our feet. Uh, we need to be ready to administer the gospel of Jesus at a moment's notice, verse 15. And the sword of the Spirit, the, the word of God, we need to be defending each other, speaking Jesus into each other's lives. So when someone falls and says, I've just done that sin one too many times, God's never going to forgive me. We take the sword of the Spirit and say there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We take the sword of the Spirit and say, Jesus died once for the righteous, for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. You're in as you'll ever be. Reminding each other that God has not failed, that his sovereignty has not been compromised, his goodness has not been watered down when the wheels are falling off our life. Because, verse 13, we need to be ready for the evil day. Now commentators talk about the evil day and they can't seem to agree whether Paul is talking about every day as being an evil day or whether he's talking about the end of time, a day of evil that is coming. Uh, those are the kind of the two views. I personally think that Paul is being deliberately vague to keep us on our toes saying that a day of evil is coming and it will come to your life. 
the bell has rung. Ting, ting. Satan is in the ring. And he's bringing a day of evil into your life. You don't know whether it will be today, tomorrow, this year, next year, but it is coming. Keep us on our toes as Satan throws everything at us from the spiritual realm and to try and to try and uh, bring dishonor to Jesus. Paul says it will be like flaming arrows raining down from the sky. Imagine an arrow coming out of the night sky. You can't hear it, you can't see it. Heart piercing, flesh burning arrows. That's how he compares it. And we need to be ready so that we will stand. So that we'll stand together, so that we'll stand for each other. We need to get on with it today. Uh, because fighting this fight looks pretty normal. That's our final thing that I want us to say today. Fighting looks pretty normal. Uh, the thing that I love about the arm of God and this closure to Ephesians is that Paul paints this extravagant, this scary, this cosmic and pretty weird picture. Uh, you can see why tons of books are written about it and uh, it's one of those famous passages in the Bible. But wearing this armour looks pretty normal. As you read through chapter 6 verse 10 and onwards, you see that putting the, putting the armour on looks like committing to church, reading your Bible, saying your prayers, looking out for each other, speaking the gospel to each other and helping each other do that for each other. I love the way that Paul returns from this, just this strange picture of spiritual warfare and like with the turn of a switch, he just returns back to normal, to the kind of the normal everyday mundane, mundaneness of the Christian life. And I, I just love this picture that, 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 that they kind of just do it together, this gospel team. He says, verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. He's commanding Ephesians to pray for him so that he would go about his gospel ministry in the prison where he is. He says pray all the time for everything and anything. He says pray for each other, be alert and watch out for each other. He wants the Ephesians to be praying so that they would be alert and he wants the Ephesians praying that he would proclaim the gospel fearlessly in the midst of suffering. It's a brilliant picture, this end of Ephesians, of the gospel team working together, looking out for each other, getting on with it. See, it's very easy in the Christian life to be a lone ranger. See, when it comes to our Christian life, it's very easy to be self-reliant, self-centered, looking out for number one forgetting that we are all together in Christ. That the Christian life is not a solo sport, it is a team sport. That we are on the pitch together. Or we go to church, we go to church, but we go, and, and, and we go to church, but that's it. We go to church and we're not part of the family. We're not in anyone else's life. It's easy to treat your midweek group like a Bible class and go to church or go to group when you need a little bit of spiritual top-up. But if you're not feeling it, well, I just won't go. It's easy to get into this mindset of just not really bothering with our Bibles. That, oh, that's just a bit cool. There's no social kudos for doing something in secret. It's very easy to get into the mindset as a solo player and think, well, I don't need to contact other Christians during the week. And, but I'm very quick to complain about when someone doesn't make an effort with me. Friends, things go pear-shaped when we cut ourselves off from God's people. We are saved as a church. We are called into a team sport. We're called to care for, to walk with and do life together. 
I don't think I'd have survived a particularly difficult year in London without a good friend (laughs) just getting alongside me and pointing me to Jesus and reminding me of the gospel. As I reflect, I've seen too many people give up living for Jesus. And it started when they stopped being part of their church. It started when they closed their Bibles. It started when they gave up on praying to the Lord. Paul says, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's be praying for each other. That's what Paul is saying here. Pray for me. Let me pray for each other. Be praying for each other. Be praying for each other's godliness. Be praying for each other's fearlessness in sharing Jesus. Be praying for each other's marriage or praying for the marriages here at church. Be praying for our unity. Let's jump to prayer rather than the keyboard. Let's jump to prayer rather than complaints. And be ready for the evil day. See, when someone is down, let's pick each other up. Speaking Jesus into each other's weeks. Facebooking, emailing, doing life together, doing lunch together. Asking, how is it going in this war? Don't just do small talk over coffee afterwards. Ask, how are you going? How are you feeling? Where is Satan targeting you at the minute? Let me encourage you if, you, if you've not committed to this family, if you know that you are just an attender to a service, commit to the family. The door is open. The, 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 the place at the table is prepared for you. Commit to the family. Invest in the family. Be on mission with the family. God isn't done with this trophy cabinet that, that is Warmbra, Church of God, uh, Warmbra Community Church. Don't be a spectator. Don't be a passenger. Be part of the family. That's what Paul wants for us. That is what he's going to take to survive this battle and stand firm. Now, when it comes to this letter, it's very easy to leave off the last couple of verses from these letter verses 21 to 24. But they are a great picture of the church just getting on with life in the normal way. I love it. Uh, The Apostle Paul has sent Tychicus, verse 21, um, to deliver this Ephesian letter to the Ephesian church. And he's he's sent him at great expense and great risk. So he says, verse 22, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. As I reflect back on this whole letter of Ephesians, how we've seen how we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ as part of God's plan for glory, how we've been raised from death to life, how we've been taken from being strangers to God's promises to inheritors of God's promises because of the work of Christ. I'm massively encouraged. I think that's his purpose. The purpose is Paul's writing this so that he would encourage them And he's encouraged me, and I hope it's encouraged you too. I pray that it has. As we take up this invitation to stand in Jesus, stand together as one in Jesus, to put on the armor of God together as his church, to grow in maturity in Jesus together, to walk as the bride of Christ, in God's world together and to stand firm as life throws the kitchen sink at us. Stand firm together. And as we do so, we get to watch God do amazing things in this world and in our lives, in us and through us for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you that you are so gracious to us that you would not have us do life in ignorance, that you would not have us engage in this battle uh, uninformed or ill-equipped. We praise you again that you've given to us everything in Christ for this life to stand firm. I pray particularly for anyone here who is feeling 
like they're just holding on with their, their, by their fingernails in Jesus, that they're feeling like giving up. I pray, Lord, that you would remind them of the gospel, that they have nothing to prove, no one to please, because Jesus has done it all, that you would remind them that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, that you remind them that Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, bring us to you. Pray that you would remind them and encourage them. And I pray for us all that we would indeed take seriously the threat from Satan, that we would make every effort to maintain our unity when we feel like uh, uh, taking, to the, uh, taking, to, taking up the sword against other Christians. I pray, Lord, that we would make every effort to maintain the unity, to turn to prayer rather than aggression to turn to love and uh, love and gospel uh, rather than negativity. Help us to make every effort to be alert so that we might know afresh your goodness to us in Christ and we might stand every day of our lives in him until we meet you face to face in glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>